my point was that um, uh, that that this was unbelievably terrifying, and I feel like what you're talking about was vastly worse, vastly more terrifying. And yet, you were so courageous and so resilient and so positive in terms of your mindset through this whole process. How is that possible? Is this just something? <laughs> is, is I'm, this a, you were I'm an alien. Yeah, I'm an alien. I don't. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so it was interesting when I was writing the book because my um, publisher and agent, they're like, well, you've got to, you know, explain how freaked out you were and upset. And I go, but that's not what I did. Like I didn't, that's not how I responded. Like I actually respond in a crisis very differently because I've been trained on how to respond in a crisis. It's just like when you look at ER docs or paramedics, they're not going to go running to an accident scene and go, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, no, yeah. they've been trained. So when you look at this, we actually can learn how to show up when things are challenging. Because when you really look at it, like go back into elementary school and junior high and high school, what we really need to learn is how to show up and how to have great relationships and how to be a good friend. Like, cause these are the things most of us are going to end up being caretakers in our life, either for, you know, children or for parents, you know, it's just part of life. I was fortunate in my thirties, early thirties, like it was actually late twenties, early thirties. I got a mentor and she was going to teach me how to be successful in business so I could make a bigger impact on the world. And I go move in with her and I'm so excited. I'm going to learn how to be successful in business because I have this, I, you know, I want to help the world get healthy and she's going to help me do it. And she didn't teach me anything related to business for six months. And for six months, all she did was work on mindset training. Turns out she was one of the top mindset trainers anywhere. And, uh, but I was so frustrated at first because I was like, first of all, I was like, how am I going to, how am I going to survive and pay my bills here? You know, I just, I just sold everything and moved in with you. But she kept saying, you know, you're not ready. And if you look at where people are in life, the most successful people just have gone through the most challenges. It's like, it's, it's just like, you know, baseball. If you want to have the most home runs, have, you know, the most strikeouts. I mean, it's just how life works. And so what she taught me right from there is that you really, there are no limitations. This is one of the first things she taught me is there are no limitations. There are only limitations in your mind to which I thought back then very left brain. Of course there's limitations, you know, then she said, there is no right or wrong. There just is. I'm like, of course there's right or wrong. You know, I mean, it's like, so she was telling me these things that I was like, made me question everything. But when you think about it, if you were to approach something and here's the doctor coming in to tell you the percent chance that your son's going to be brain damaged or your son's not going to survive. What about the percent chance that everything's going to be all right? Mm -hmm. Like why would, when, when they told me, you know, your son has a 0.25% chance of making it. I'm like, great. That's all I need. That's what I'm going to focus on. I'm not focusing on the other 99.75% because it does not matter. That's all that matters. So that came from that training of, you know, you get what you expect. Mm -hmm. There are no victims, only volunteers. And that if you want something to be better, then you need to make yourself stronger. You know, wish it was easier. Mm -hmm. And so all of that stuff was so entrenched in me that it basically taught me that I could pretty much create or manifest anything that I wanted. And I couldn't change the circumstance. I couldn't change whether Grant got hit by the car and I couldn't really change the chance whether he was going to survive or not, but I could change how I showed up. I could change how I chose to help, who I chose to recruit, what I could do. That was all in my control. And so that's what I did. And I, and I will tell you, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like I walk into the hospital, they tell me he got hit and I went, okay, you know, no, I mean, it, it there was, I had to process it, but even, even then it was my brain searching for how can I, how can I fix this? What can I do here? What's, you know, that's just where my brain went. And yeah. I think if you have something like that to hold on to, it keeps you going even when it's really dark. 
and you know, some of those times, especially Friday nights in the hospital, for some reason were so depressing to me because no one was around. It was always just me sitting there with my son, with the machines beeping, you know, hoping for something. But I would look for signs. I'd look for what I called little miracles, his little wins, like, you know, he'd squeeze my finger or make eye contact, or I would sneak in all sorts of things. Like I'd, I'd throw little balls into his hand to see if he could catch and squeeze. I'd look for anything to show me that he was improving. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like what you what you, what's that, that word? It's like, basically, you know, it's like you get what you expect. I just expected him to make it through there. And, and I knew that if he didn't make it, but that I'd done everything that I possibly could to help him get there, I could be at peace with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things you said there, and I'm, I'm going to maybe not quote you exactly, but basically something to the effect of the most, the, the, the people with the strongest mindset, the people who are the most resilient are the ones who have been through the most stuff. How do we cultivate resilience in the absence of tragedy, in the absence of going through really horrible things? Is it possible or is this something that's just like any degree of intellectual understanding and sort of practicing the mindset stuff doesn't actually translate into real toughness when it actually matters. Well, you know, I didn't have the tragedy before. I had the mindset before the tragedy. Mm. The time to get the mindset is not when you're in the middle of the tragedy. That's like, you know, drowning in the ocean and you've got an unblown up life preserver, you know? I mean, that's, so you've got to develop it first. And literally what I did way back when, it was back in the days of the Sony Walkman. You probably don't even know what this thing is. I do, I do, I do. Okay. I'm, I'm 35. I'm not quite <laughs> young, but. I was like, it's this little thing. They put tapes in it. You put it in your ears. And I used to get these tapes from Nightingale Conant, Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, Ogmandino. I tightly controlled my environment. I stopped listening to the news. I mean, if there wasn't a better time than now to not listen to the news, I don't know when there is. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So I did, you know, when you look at what's going on out there, it's mainly negative stuff. So I stopped with all of that. I started managing my environment, what I read, who I, who I spent time with. I spent time with people. I mean, that's why, you know, Mindshare Summit's so cool is it's a tightly curated event of people who want to help each other and want to be better themselves and make a bigger difference in the world. And so I made sure those were the people I was spending time with. That was the, the things I was reading and listening to. And that's, started to make the big difference. And then I started just to watch how I, you know, all the things that happened because it doesn't take a big tragedy to test you. We're tested every day. You know, I remember back when I was working one-on-one -on -one with clients, I had one gal who was so stressed out and having so many challenges. Her daughter was getting bat mitzvah. That was her big stress, her big challenge, right? So, you know, it doesn't need to be some massive thing. It could be someone cutting you off at a red light. How do you respond? Mm -hmm. you know, it could be someone like, you know, stealing your blog post. How do you respond? I watched people. I'm like, really? That's like these things. Like every time is an opportunity for you to show up better, right? There's all sorts of opportunities for it. And each time, I think what happens is you don't realize how many things most people would think are little things, you know, or, or big things that you don't even recognize anymore. It's that whole don't sweat the small stuff thing. Yeah. You know, I think it's interesting, but I, I've noticed a psychological tendency and I don't know if there's any actual scientific literature on this or if there's any scientific terminology around this phenomenon, but I've noticed that people seem to all normalized to whatever level of challenge they have in their life and whatever level of challenge, no matter how objectively easy someone may have it, almost everybody perceives themselves to be struggling, perceives themselves to have it hard and perceives themselves to be stressed. And I, you know, there's, there's some people that I encounter that have really, really easy lives, lives yeah. and perceive themselves to be terribly stressed and have it really hard. And I'm like, you should maybe like travel a bit. And, <laughs> and but see you know, it's so great. Hard I, people actually have it. I know. Let's drop you off in some of these countries. Yeah. It, it's because it's perception, it can be shifted. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So that's what's so super cool about it is I think a lot of it's our languaging. Um, it's funny. I was talking to my son and he's he was upset about something. And I go, you know, I listen to you whenever you get upset. You use this like I'm stressed out of my mind. I'm like, maybe we could shift that language, you know, because <laughs> I actually believe that we're never better than when we're challenged. Mm -hmm. That when we have something that's bigger than us that we need to work against or work for or towards, like that's when you really show up. That's your opportunity to show up as your best self. I think that the challenge we have is that our society like almost celebrates people being so stressed out and mm -hmm. all of, and it's like ridiculous, you yeah. know? I mean, I have one friend who I've can't really spend much time with anymore because every time you call her, she's so slammed and she's so busy and she's so stressed. I'm like, yeah. man, I actually get done 10 times what you get done. And I don't ever spend one time bit saying that or complaining about it. Yeah. And I think that's the other part. It's like, wh what's the difference between I get to and I have to, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, right now I'm unpacking in my new house and some, you might go, oh my gosh, I have to unpack. And I'm like, I get to unpack in a like new house on the water in Tampa. Oh my gosh, I'm so lucky. Right. Yeah. So it's just, it's just changing that perspective. And I think that the easiest way to do that is to watch who you hang out with, because if you're hanging out, out with positive people, they will call you on it and go, Hey, you know, help you reframe it. Right. I mean, John Asraf's a great example of one. Yeah. I've listened to his languaging. He has great languaging around it. He does. Yeah. I remember w when I was his personal trainer 10 years ago. And I remember one day he had something where like his, his business partner for this business that they had, like had a stroke and there was like the business was like falling apart. And, uh, and he was like, somehow he showed up for his training session that morning. And he had a big smile on his face and he was happy and he was telling me about the whole thing. He was, I mean, normal, like his normal level of happiness. And I'm like, he told me the whole story of what happened. And I'm like, how are you happy right now? I don't even understand what's happening. Cause like I would be fuming. I would be <laughs> fine. I'd be, you know, I, I would be panicking and somehow he was happening. He's like, he said to me, how would panicking right now help anything? And so he's like, just, you know, so how, how do we get to that place? Like you are embodying, he's embodying where you are the opposite of that pattern that I just talked about of somebody who objectively doesn't have it that hard, doesn't have a lot of struggles, but perceives themselves to be stressed and have a really difficult life. How do we be in the opposite scenario where we may actually have re lots of real challenges in our life, but we handle them with ease and with a smile and, you know, while remaining happy and in a good yeah. place. Well, Carol Dweck out of Stanford talks about this growth versus fixed mindset. So the first part of it is knowing that you actually can shift this. It's all in your power to do so. And it's like anything else. It's like exercise, you know, mindset's a muscle. You need to take it to the gym. And the stuff that I learned back in my late 20s, early 30s became so much a part of me and it didn't happen overnight. It happened over time. I'll share some of the things she did. But it became so much a part of me that when I wrote this book, you know, when the whole thing happened with Grant, everyone's like, I don't understand. How the heck are you doing this? Because I mean, I launched a New York Times bestselling book next to my son in a coma. I have the pictures of me with my laptop sitting next to him in a coma, talking to him, you know, <laughs> doing this. And like, I don't even get how you did that. And, and I had forgotten that I even had this mentor. I'd forgotten all the training that we'd gone through because I was it. It became me. It was who I was. And I wasn't that way when I met her. I had total limiting beliefs, super judgmental. There are right or wrong. Of course, you know, it's like you can't just create something. And um, it happened over time. It happened with her first putting rubber bands on my wrist. And every time I thought of a critical or limiting belief, a critical thought, limiting belief, I had to snap my wrist. And you do that enough, you stop doing it, <laughs> you know? And then I started to really tightly control the people that I spent time around. I am so, I have an amazing group of friends and I'm really careful about who I let into that inner circle. Um, you know, I just, I always, I have a helper mentality. I always want to kind of like rescue those negative Nellies out there, but if they're not changing, then, you know, let them be. Um, and then always surround yourself with like 
the books that you read? What are you, what are the podcasts that you're listening to? What are you doing? And, and it's, gosh, it's easier now than ever, really. Um, it's harder and it's easier. It's harder because there's all this silly stuff all over the place. I mean, it's like, you know, all the politics and ridiculousness, but it's easier because we can decide which podcasts, right? We can decide which blogs, we can block things. So, you know, it's just making that part of your daily practice every day, getting up, getting out your journal, writing down three things you appreciate, you're grateful for. That's so easy. doesn't cost anything. Ending the day, looking at three things that went great today. And it could be that you like are alive at the end of the day. That's a great day. You know, it's like you're at the end of the day and you're in a house with running water and electricity. You've got a majority of the people in the world, you know, you've got, you've got it easier than them. So, you know, it's like celebrate that. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you. Sometimes when my kids start to talk and, you know, I've got, my kids are not, are not spoiled kids by any means, but sometimes I'm like, you know, I think I really need to take you and go drop you off <laughs> in a third world country. So you really start to understand what you have here. Yeah. Hey there, this is Ari again. One more quick thing before you go. Just make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Energy Blueprint, and also make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform, whether that's iTunes or Stitcher or anything else. Hope you guys enjoyed this interview, and I will see you again next week.